are, we are just so thankful because you love us and uh, you have brought us into a relationship with you and now we have fellowship with you. We do have that, <clears throat> that uh, connection to you and by, the, by our salvation we are now in your family and how thankful we are for that. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that today we can come as a, as a body of believers and lift our praise to you in a corporate way. And may that take place. May our hearts today be motivated by your grace. May we be here because we love you and we want to be participating in this worship. May we be an encouragement to others. May as we sing, as Paul said, may we be speaking to one another in hymns and psalms and spiritual songs. I pray, Father, that you would use the service to encourage hearts. For that one who may be here this morning who they are just discouraged and maybe even contemplating just walking away from the things of you and your word. And I pray that you would encourage them and lift their heart today. We pray specifically this morning for the Dixon family, for Steve and the families they've gathered around and Lord we understand that Brenda's not well and very close to death they've said and close to heaven's door I would pray that if it's your will to take her home father that you would do that and that the family then would be given your grace to walk this path I pray father that you would just again make the joy of the Lord as their strength and in the in this hospital room when Others gather, may people see something very different in the way that they're handling this very difficult time. Father, we know that this morning each of us have burdens in our heart and, and things that we carry, things that you have brought into our lives. How I pray that each one of us will learn that the more we serve you and the more we commit our life to what you've called us to do, the greater joy we'll have. So we just ask you to take this service now and be able to use it in each of our hearts. May you be glorified, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hymn books, please, this morning and turn to number 198. 198, and as you do that, stand together as we sing it, The Wonderful Grace of Jesus.
fountain, sparkling like a fountain, a sufficient place for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, even greater than the Why don't you praise his name this morning as you rejoice in his wonderful grace. As you make your way back to your seats, if you would, take out your bulletin and remain standing as we read the scripture together this morning. In your bulletin, you'll find the scripture reading. Uh, it's listed there, and it's uh, found in the book of John, John chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. And uh, we will read it all together today. Uh, as you see there, there's no light and dark, so we'll just read it all together, and uh, we can do that. So let's begin in, in verse 9 of John chapter 15. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. What a wonderful passage reminding us of the Father's love for us and our need to love others in response to him. I hope you'll think about those things as we continue this morning. Would you please be seated? Our charge from Jesus to keep his commandments and to love that requires us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Take your hymn books, please. Turn to number 506 and sing. I will sing of my Redeemer.
looked at the screen this morning, keeping our theme going, recognizing Christ's love, his care for us, we call to him, give me Jesus. We shout to the Lord, he is the one who sustains us. Nothing compares. He is our sustainer. He is our life. He gives us what we need to carry on. We are sustained in Christ alone. Oh, 
Until life's last breath, we have some folks that we've been praying for that they're coming to that last moment of their breath, and I we pray for them that they'll stay faithful and that God will fill them with that hope in uh, in Himself. So let's pray and let's give in our worship. Father, I thank you this morning that you have brought into our lives salvation, that you brought us to the place of of being able to have a eternal relationship with you, and so. May we each one have that hope to the end. May you fill us with that joy of knowing that someday we will take our last breath and the next breath we take will be the breath of heaven. May that fill our hearts and for those that stand beside the bed of a dying loved one who are on their way there, may they be filled with your joy and that understanding. And as they grieve, may you fill their heart with that hope of eternal life that you have given us. May we worship you now in our giving, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
He is worthy. We thank him. Take that message in your heart throughout this week, a message of thankfulness and hope, thanking the Lord for his love. Amen. Is he worthy? Amen. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Got a scourge on that one, apparently. Um, you know, I trust you look forward to the day that we get to be around the throne. I mean, again, we talk about it, but there will be that day in which we get to be there and we get to give glory to him. And what a great opportunity that will be. If you have your Bible open to Ephesians 5, we're going to come back this morning to the to the passage that we have been in and we're going to, today we're going to finish up this matter about the filling of the Holy Spirit and how it looks and what it is and all of that. You'll remember that really, and again, chapter 4 began the practical section of the book of Ephesians where it said, walk worthy in the manner to which we have been called and then he's been dealing with our walk and again, practicality of our Christian life, how we're supposed to look, how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to sound, where we're supposed to walk and all kinds of practical issues and when he came to chapter 5 and verse 17 he began to summarize yet again another section by saying therefore don't be unwise but understand what the will of the Lord is and then he moves down and he begins to tell us more about what that is. And at verse 18 he said, Stop being drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but start being or keep being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. It's kind of interesting, again, if you were to study out the passage, there is great consternation on the, on the hearts of uh, <coughs> the uh, commentators of the books that are written as to whether verse 21 belongs to the section of 18, 19, and 20, or does it belong to verse 22? Again, this is one of those questions that seems to me to be a no-brainer. I mean, the obvious thing is, the verb was to be filled. And as I've been saying to you, there are four, there's a series of four participles that were modifying being filled with the Spirit. The first one was speaking to one another. <coughs> the second is singing to one another. The third one was psalming to one another. The fourth one is giving thanks to one another. Now, if you'll notice, the next verse starts with yet another participle. Because there aren't actually four, there are actually five. And there's no end to the sentence at the end of verse uh, 20. It seems to just, it doesn't seem to, it just moves on. In fact, <coughs> if you remember when we began Ephesians, I said to you, Paul loves long sentences. We've seen that in the book. Chapter 1, 3 to 14 is all one sentence. And even though it may be different sentences in your translation... 
it was all one sentence. Well, from verse 18 to verse 21, it's all one sentence. There's no period. It all goes together. So here's my point just to begin with. Whatever we're going to say about submitting to one another in the reverence of Christ, whatever it is we're going to say, it flows out of being filled with the Spirit. And you can no more do verse 21 without the filling of the Spirit than you can do verse 19 or 20. You can't effectively speak or sing or psalm or give thanks. I searched all week this week, by the way, for an S word for thanksgiving. I wanted an S word so I could say, speak, sing, psalm, submit. I just couldn't come up with one. I googled it, looked at every thesaurus I could find, I couldn't find one. So if you have one, tell me at the door and then I'll go, oh, I wish I told you earlier. But anyway, so we'll just have to keep having a non-S word for giving thanks. But you hear my point. The thing is, is again, the practicality of being filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit will flow out in our lives in very practical everyday manner and verse 21 is in that same context. Well you will remember I hope that one thing we've said is it's in a context of church group meetings especially. Speaking to one another. Singing to one another. Psalming with one another. Giving thanks with one another. These were all things that were done in a corporate way during their worship services. Certainly they were done outside of the corporate worship. Certainly they were being encouraged to be done one-on-one -on -one with one another. But the idea was is that we are together and as we are together we can do these things. And we said like with music, part of music is not just singing to the Lord. It is singing to encourage other people. It is speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So why then do we get to verse 21 and we, we yank it out and we stick it before verse 22 as if it's an introduction to that verse that you talk about fear and trepidation. The next section of this book is going to be I may just jump to verse chapter 6 verse 1. You just I could just do that. But my point is we wives submit to your own husbands and a lot of times it is connected to verse 21 as if somehow verse 21 is not connected to verses 18, 19 and 20. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to connect it to the to the filling of the Holy Spirit and we are going to disconnect it for the time being from verse 22. Certainly what's going on in verses 18 to 21 is going to reflect on the next, there are three relationships that are going to be mentioned from verse 22 down to chapter 6, 9, and those three relationships are husband and wife, parents and children, slaves and masters. Again, he is going to, in a very practically way, work out what all of this is saying, specifically the filling of the Spirit. But for our purposes today, we're going to keep it connected because I think it is. And so a lot of our focus today on what in the world this is, this whole matter of being filled with the Spirit, excuse me, being submitting to one another, is a matter of us as a body learning how to get along. You know... It'd be hard to believe this, I'm sure for some of us, but we are all different. Okay? Like, I'm shocked that you all don't, that, uh, let me put it this way, let me back up. I am shocked that all of you don't love Southern Gospel music. I'm just shocked. Some of you, I could check your iPods or your music device or your record collection for you older folks, okay? Anyway, and I wouldn't find one lick of the cathedrals. I wouldn't even find one. I've got every one of them on my iPod. And I, and I you know, I, I, that, I, so I can't believe you don't like that. But then again, some of you think I'm weird because I don't like highbrow operatic stuff. <sighs> I... I was, I was doing a little research on Beethoven the other day because I did a, a lesson for our Oak Tree kids on death. 
And I remembered, at least I thought I remembered from somewhere in my past, that Beethoven was deaf. And so I did a research on that, found out some interesting things. He didn't actually start going deaf till he was 28. By the time he was 31, he was pretty deaf, but deaf, not deaf. He didn't die for a few more years. But anyway, he was deaf. But by the, it wasn't until he was about 45-ish that he was basically uh, profoundly deaf. And so I found that intriguing. And I went on to find Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which has the famous song Ode to Joy in it, which was written when he was completely deaf. He didn't hear anything he played. They said that when he debuted the Ninth Symphony, uh, they had to actually turn him around to see the audience because he couldn't hear the applause. I mean, you know, well, I'm saying all that to say in searching for that to try to find some, I found this, some symphonic orchestra somewhere and they were singing like that and I went, wow, I'm glad I don't have to listen to this all the time. I'm just doing my research, you know. Um, I just was like, but some of you, you would have just been, oh, you would have been in heaven just about with that. We are all different. And so some of us, again, we've talked about it before, but we, we each have our own likes and dislikes. And as long as they're not unbiblical, we need to learn to submit to one another. We need to figure out how it is that you can put up with my southern gospel enjoyments and I have to put up with you and some of your more operatic and some of you... <laughs> don't like the Giants, which just shocks me, but, um, you know, and some of you don't like the Packers even, which is really a shock, but you get my point. And we come in that door, and sometimes what happens is one, one schism in the church decides that whatever it is they like, they're going to make that the most important thing, and they start to fight over that, and then kind of sounds like the Corinthian church group of Peterites and Paulites and Apollites and then Apolloites and then Jesusites. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and the point of a lot of this is saying we need to learn how to get along. We need to learn how to be more submissive. So let's figure out what is order. What do I mean by that? Well, the word for submit is a word hupotasso. Aren't you excited to put that in your notes, by the way? Uh, hupotasso. And it just simply means to line up in order. If you want to know what society is like without order, go to Bangladesh. <laughs> or go to Thailand. That is society with no order. Oh, my word. I mean, I am so... They never let me drive in those countries. And... Uh, Thailand, I think I might be able to drive and not kill myself. Bangladesh, don't, I wouldn't even want to be behind the wheel of a car. I, I, I just wouldn't. I mean, there's just, there, there is no order. I mean, you, it's 60 miles between the hospital and Chittagong. I've told you this before. But it takes about four to five hours. Why? Because the road is horrendous? Nope. Because you don't know what's coming at you from this way or this way or this way. And you just, you, you just can't start going lickety-split because you could have a cow walk out on the road. Or you could have a person walk out or, the, I mean, any number of things. But we live in a fairly orderly society. And the word means to be in order. Can you imagine, I've never been in the military, so those of you that were can speak more directly to such a thing, but I can imagine if the military had no order, it would be total chaos. If nobody listened to the lieutenant or nobody listened to the general or whatever is up on the upper, you know, if the sergeant wasn't listening. I mean, just imagine if all of a sudden the buck private said, hey, I'm in charge here. I mean, there would be, again, it would be chaos. Well, the idea here is that God has set up Order, orderly systems in like the military, in the home, in the church. I mean, God has established order and it means to come into cooperation. Let me just give you a few words that I kind of wrote down for myself that order is. Submission and order are things like harmony, blending. Don't you always enjoy the choir when they sing? Okay, good. I got, we, got three, we got three yeses and a couple of... Oh, but anyway, uh, let me ask that question again. Do we enjoy the choir when they sing? Amen. Oh, good. Okay, good, good. All right. And the orchestra when they play? Amen. 
And the preacher when he preached. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, just, just, just kidding. Anyway, but my point is, can you imagine if the trumpets decided they were just going to play whatever they wanted? And the trombone said, nuts on the music. I don't even like those notes. And so then they just, and then the choir just decided, I don't even like Give Me Jesus. I'm going to start singing Amazing Grace. You know, and I mean, just think of the chaos and disorder that would be. You couldn't have a choir because you need blending. How many times does Ron say to us, listen to the person beside you and try to blend your voice with them? And the idea here is that in a church, somehow we are to be in harmony. We are to be blending. We are to be in cooperation. We are to be giving the right of way. Giving the right of way. That means that there are times where we have to give in. Not, I'm not talking about compromising doctrine or that. You all understand me. But there are times where we have to say, okay, I'm going to give way to my brother. Because they enjoy that. And then, hopefully, later on, they'll give way to you. I, I, I couldn't help but get away, and so I, I looked it up, and I mean, I, yeah, you can find anything on Google. I'm so thankful for Google. What did I do before Google? I, I mean, it was, I, I try to think back to that. How did I preach without Google? I mean, she's, I know one way was, I had a book like this of illustrations, and uh, sometimes I'd grab them from there, but... Man, a lot of times I had to go get a, like, if I wanted to look up Beethoven, I had to go actually, <laughs> can you imagine, go to an encyclopedia. I mean, how, how tiring was that? I mean, brother. And then, so, anyway, so I, I looked up the words to the song that Frank Sinatra was sort of known for. Remember that his song? I've done it my way. Let me read you a few of the words to it. It says, and now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway. And more, much more than this, I did it my way. The, latter, the last little paragraph says this. For what is man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has not. The right to say the things he feels and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took the blows and did it my way. That is kind of the life song of some people. They think that they have a right to always do it their way. It's my way or the highway. I mean, again, we're not talking about major things in life. We are talking about getting along with one another. I, again, because I'm somewhat old, I, do you remember Burger King used to have a, uh, their, their theme was what? You can have it your way. I always wanted to actually go in and ask for a Big Mac. I did. I never did it, but I always wanted to walk in and say, I'd like to have a Big Mac, please. And I was going to wait for them to say, sorry, we don't sell them here. We have, we have Whoppers. Well, I don't want a Whopper. I want to have it my way. So make me a Big Mac. Do you think they would have? Probably not. Now, you know, they, they're open from whatever, say, 9 to, nine, to 9. You know, let's just say 9 to 9. What if I showed up at like 11 o'clock? I want it my way. I'm hungry for a Big Mac. It's 11 o'clock. I don't think they're going to open for me, okay? It was kind of a lie, have it your way. They weren't really true to me. But I found this. Listen, this was in the advertisement for Burger King. Listen to this. It says, you have the right to have what you want exactly when you want it. Because on the menu of life, you are, quote, today's special. And tomorrow... I, I, I'm going to tell you something. When I read that, I got a little nervous. Have you ever been to a diner? I wasn't sure I was really into that. But anyway, and tomorrow, see, you're today's special, and tomorrow's, and the day after that, and, well, you get the drift. Yes, that's right. Listen, we may be the king, Burger King, we may be the king, but you, my friend, are the almighty ruler. 
huh. Yeah, okay, I want my Big Mac, sir. Um, I, I, my point is, is part of submission is being able to say, all right, Lord, I need to give way. I need to blend. I need to be in harmony. I need to not create disorder. I need to make sure that I am in order as you have called me to. Obviously, as we move forward in, the, in these three relationships, husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and slaves, it's going to be all about that. Everybody taking their role, everybody having their own responsibility. And here, us in the local church, we find our place. The local church is not a place of individualism. Now don't get me wrong, we all want, we don't want to, we're not trying to have be cookie cutters, we don't want everybody to, nobody wants everybody to be like me, that's for sure. So we're not asking about that, but what we're saying is, when we come together as a group, as a body, then we learn how to, to give way to somebody else's likes and dislikes. And, and that's what order is. Order is learning that. Order is learning how to prefer others better than ourselves. Order is about saying, all right, God, I need to learn my role. And in the local church, we do that. And we submit to one another. Well, who are we to be in order with? I mean, what does that actually look like? Well, I want to take you to a number of passages to show you at least some of the practical places where the Scripture says we are to be in submission. Let's go to Romans chapter 13. If you're thinking ahead with me or thinking with me, you may have been thinking ahead to where I may be going, but let's go to Romans chapter 13. In Romans 13, mentioned at least two other times in the New Testament, in Titus and in Peter, the same thought is there. Chapter 13, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists that authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. I mean, what an interesting statement, as best I know. Nero was on the throne of Rome when Paul wrote that. Was Nero a good guy or a bad guy? Kind of a bad guy, okay? He burned Rome. He, he blamed it on the Christians. He did a lot of really bad things. And yet, Paul said, be subject to them because no authority exists except appointed by God. Now, of course... We understand that this related to the first century and not to the current administration in America, right? Oh, wait a minute. Uh, no, actually, it does mean today. Now, don't misunderstand me. That doesn't mean that... I don't think, for instance, let me, let me use an illustration... Daniel worked for 70 years in the administration of the Babylonian Empire, book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar, wicked man that he was, was Daniel's boss, and eventually I think Nebuchadnezzar came to faith in Jehovah God. But my point is, I don't think that Daniel would have believed that everything Nebuchadnezzar did or said was right, but he submitted to that. For instance, in Daniel 6, the story of Daniel and the lion's den that we tell all of our children, we have all these wonderful flannel graph stories or PowerPoint stories or videos, depending on your age bracket. But anyway, we have all these great things and we show usually this young man, and he wasn't, he was at least 85 when he was in the lion's den. And, but we, but we, oh, we just tell the story so, you know, almost glibly. But wait a minute, you say, oh, see, Daniel, Daniel, uh, rebelled against the authorities. Well, he didn't actually rebel. He just said, I'm going to do what God called me to do and I'll suffer the consequences. Like he didn't picket the, the Medo-Persian Empire. He didn't, because by then the Medo-Persians had taken over. He didn't picket the Medo-Persian Empire to change the law. He said, well, that's the law, but I'm not going to stop praying. I'm just probably going to get eaten by lions. See, we are to be somehow in 
under that authority and at least respect the authority, the authority that's there because at the end of the day, once we have cast our ballot, I usually say this every year around election time, we go and we do our due diligence and we do our duty and we vote for who we think God wants us to vote for, but the next day when they declare the winner, we have to believe God appointed them into that place. And for various and sundry reasons, well, let's move on because, you know, I don't want to camp on that. But go to chapter 16 of the book of Romans. Paul in, the, in, in this chapter says a little bit more along this line. He is referencing uh, the, uh, the leadership. And look at it in chapter 16 and verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned. Uh, for those are such who do not serve the Lord Jesus, but their own belly by smooth words. For obedience is, for your obedience has become known to all. For I'm glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Paul is telling us that there is a place where we are to be submissive to the leadership that God has established in the churches. And we'll talk about that even more. Um, in, in another place. Um, come with me to 1 Peter in chapter 5. Come with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. This is a passage that more relates to, to me or any other pastor than it does to you per se, although by application we can, we can apply it to all of us. But look at it in verse chapter 5 and verse 5. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Now again, sometimes we as parents have sort of misapplied that passage. We tell our children they need to respect their elders. Well, in the context, the elder there is the pastor, teacher, elder. And I think it's more about the younger being in submission to the older because they have greater maturity. Now again, certainly we can by application make it mean the other. But I think sometimes we as when I was a young pastor, I trust if I look back, I could say I was willing to listen to the older pastors. I think I've told you, but one time when we were in Baker, Montana, the only time I ever got really close to saying I've had enough, God brought an older pastor into our lives, and John Simmons. And Now again, I've often thought back, I would love to go back and find out how old he was then, uh, because he probably wasn't as old as I thought he was. Um, but God brought him into our lives and I had to be willing to listen and I praise God that I did and he gave me some good counsel and I'm still in ministry today. I may not have been had it not been a John Simmons. And there is an order, there is a submissiveness. But I want you to come with me to Luke chapter 2. Because I want us to just think a little bit about a subject that you know about, but I think it relates to this whole matter of what is order and who am I supposed to be in order with. Luke chapter 2 and verse 51. This is after the story of, of uh, Jesus going up uh, to Jerusalem with his parents. And so this was not a two-year-old. And so he said in verse 51, he went down with them, came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. If you want a good conundrum, if you want a horn of a dilemma, and you would like to stay awake tonight, uh, even though you won't because you lost an hour last night, but if you want something to think on that I don't know that you'll ever come up with a good answer to because nobody else has, what does that mean? Jesus submitted himself to his earthly parents. I mean, he was God. Now, I get it theologically, and we're going to touch on it in a minute. I understand it theologically, but can you imagine Jesus is God in flesh? He had all the power, all the authority of God, and yet he was willing to obey his parents. When Joseph said, Jesus, you need to go and and do this or do that or Mary said son I need you to do this or that he was obedient to them he never said do you know who I am I mean just to make sure we're clear here I mean I just think again it, and yes it's a great passage for we as 
parents and children, and we may reference it again when we get to that uh, Ephesians 6 part. However, this is Jesus. So come with me to Philippians in chapter 2 to again the passage that we call the kenosis. We call it that because of the verb that's in the passage. And again, I know most of you are familiar with this, but look at it. Ephesians, excuse me, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this attitude be in you all, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now again, whenever you come to this passage, especially if you're talking to a bunch of pastors or theologians, they immediately want to go to all of that deep, you know, very involved theological issues that go on in the passage and that's all necessary we need to figure out what it means but I never want people to take it out of its context because you got to make sure you remember verses 1 to 4 therefore if there is any comfort consolation in Christ of any comfort of love if any fellowship of the spirit if any affection and mercy fulfill ye my joy by being like-minded having the same love being of one accord of one mind let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself let each of you look not only on your own interest but also on the interests of others let this attitude be in you which was also in Christ Jesus this is just a practice practical example of what it means to be other-minded, others-minded. I mean, yes, it is chock full of theological uh, truth, and I mean, it is, if we didn't have this passage, we would, <coughs> we would not even have a clue to understand how the, the matter of the incarnation worked, but so we do, and it's a great passage. But it relates to how Jesus was willing as the eternal Son of God to line himself in order with the Father and in obedience to him and then to his earthly mother and father. Because that's what he says, who being in the form of God didn't consider it something to be held on to. I don't like the translation robbery. That it just has such a bad connotation to me. You didn't think it robbery. Robbery is taking something that doesn't belong to you. What the idea here is, is that Jesus didn't want to hold on to something that actually did belong to him. The fact that he was God. The fact that he uh, was the Shekinah glory of God. And so he veiled that and he made himself of no reputation. That's our verb, kenao. That's the word emptied. And so on. I mean, Jesus is the example of what it means to be submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Come with me to one more passage related to Jesus. Let's go to Mark. Go back to the Gospels in Mark chapter 10. I mean, again, if I, if I haven't yet somehow convinced you, which I'm sure I have, but let's just kind of, uh, let's take one more stab at it. This whole submitting, being in, being in harmony, blending together, being in cooperation, joining our hearts together, giving way to someone else. Mark chapter 10 and verse 43. And whoever of you desires to be first, let him be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, <coughs> but to serve and to give his life a ransom. For many. Wow. Sometimes people get upset because they say, well, no one called me, or no one followed up with me, or no one talked to me, or no one said boo to me. And, and, and there have been times that I've asked that person if I ever get a chance, but who did you talk to? Who did you serve? Who do you think might have thought, well, gee, you didn't call them? We live in a, in a society that says, I should be served. I'm everything. You can have it your way. I'm going to die saying, I lived it my way. And yet, Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. And if we were to take time, and we won't, if we were to take time to illustrate it, it's John 13 and the foot washing. I am so glad foot washing is not an ordinance. 
Yeah, even if somebody, I mean, I realize the, the grace brethren think it is, and praise God I'm not a grace brethren, because um, I can do communion, I can do baptism, but man, if somebody told me I had to wash somebody's feet, I might have to become something else. I, I might just, I might have left the grace brethren just over that, you know what I'm saying? I mean, because, oh, feet, I mean, it's just, you're filthy, dirty, rotten, smelly, sweaty feet toenails need to be clipped and just I'm trying to paint a picture am I doing a good job of it <laughs> I mean you know because don't forget when Jesus washed the disciples feet they didn't have shoes on they wore sandals their feet were caked with the dust and the dirt and the grime of the streets around Jerusalem they had, had dirt under their feet toenails and Jesus the son of God the eternal son of God got on the ground got on the floor had his his little pan of water and his towel and he washed their feet feet no such thing as feet he washed their feet I'm telling you it challenges me to say okay Lord if you really called me to do that I could do it, but I would need your grace to do it. I've, so, I've told you before, I could never have been a shoe salesman. I could sell a lot of things, but I could not be a shoe salesman. I just couldn't stare at people's feet all day. That just... And yet Jesus, the Son of God, the night before he was to die, washed their feet. Why? Because he said to them, look, I want you to understand it wasn't about my position. <clears throat> this was about serving you. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to give my life as a ransom for you. Jesus is the example. <clears throat> I mean, there just doesn't, it just doesn't get more practical than that. Submission has all of that in it. I wrote myself a, a, a five adverbs. We should be submitting willingly, humbly, mutually, lavishly, graciously. Now let me just be quick to say we need to be careful that we don't abuse our power. Sometimes people in position can do that. <clears throat> Sometimes people in position begin to take on <clears throat> that role. I'm reading, I'm, I'm reading through the, right now, in the book of Samuel, in First and Second Samuel, and trying to uh, let the Lord take me through that, because I really would like to do David, uh, the life of David eventually. And anyway, I'm, I was, so I'm reading through on, on King Saul, and I was reminded, remember how humble he was, you know, he hid and all this but phew, it wasn't long before he kind of got the kind of the sniff of that power and he abused it. Story was told of a, of a man who went to a, some kind of a leadership conference and was told, you know, good leaders assert themselves. So he came home and he said to his wife, Honey, this is what I want you to do. I want you to fix my meal. I want you to draw my bath. I want you to get my towel. And then after that, he says, uh, then I want you to get me food. And <clears throat> then he says, after that, who do you think is going to dress me and comb my hair? She said, the mortician. <laughs> oh, I just had to use that. <laughs> yeah. oh, I like that. So, yeah, well, anyway. Uh, this is a man that was abusing his power, right? Uh, you know, he was not going to make it through the day because he f forgot it's not just about barking orders. And I want you to go home today and I want you to think about this whole matter of submission to one another, to each of us. How in the world can we make that practically work out? How is it that we as a local body can say then, Lord, 
make us to be a body that serves one another. Give us the heart that we can see the needs of others and go and meet them. It isn't about being on the list of, you know, food servers or being on the list of whatever, but how can we meet somebody else's need? How can we reach out in a very practical way? I think that's what Paul is getting at <clears throat> in his final outworking of the filling of the Spirit when he said submitting to one another. One final thought and then I'm going to quit. He says you submit to one another in the fear of Christ. See, here's the idea. If our hearts are truly submitted to the Lord, then submitting to one another won't be a problem. Because the more we walk with the Lord and the more we understand His love and His grace, the more we understand what He has done for us, the more we understand the whole matter that we just talked about as far as Jesus being submissive to God's will and, and one who came not to be served but rather to serve. And the more we understand that, then the more we will submit to one another the more the unity of the body will be seen, the more that people will recognize that we are a body of people filled with the Holy Spirit. Now again, it's going to practically work itself out. All of this, the whole matter of being filled with the Spirit, is going to work itself out now as we go to look at the subject of the uh, husbands and wives, parents and children, Masters and slaves, it's gonna, there's going to be some real practical stuff there, but as it relates to us as a body, may God give that to us. May we really truly be the kind of people that look out on the needs of others. Go back and study out Philippians chapter 2 and see how that flows, that whole context, and then realize that at the end, at the, at, at the end of the passage, Jesus is glorified. We're going to give him praise anyway, because he's who deserves it. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you this morning. I know that sometimes we are so, um, <clears throat> we're so concerned about um, our own needs that sometimes we just, we just forget about looking at somebody else's. We become so uh, self-absorbed. May that not be true of us. Lord, just even today, may you burn these thoughts into our hearts and may we live them out in a very practical fashion. Even today as we leave this building, may we maybe even be an encourager today before we go home. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.